2021 arrives, and for many, it couldn't come soon enough. But does change on the calendar and in the White House mean a change of fortunes for so many struggling Americans? And with so much loss and heartache compounding every day, we'll revisit the thoughts of Michigan's poet undertaker, Thomas Lynch, on processing grief in isolation. Today is Sunday, January 3rd, 2021, and it's our annual Look Back, Look Ahead edition of Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. A very happy new year to you and yours, and I don't know that that's ever been a more sincere wish. Yes, let me wish you that 2021 be a happy new year. I saw a few headlines over the last week asking if 2020 was the worst year ever, and I shook my head at our natural inclination for hyperbole and what I refer to as the primacy of the present. But after thinking about it for a while, I realized that, yes, for many people, 2020 has been the worst year of their lives. And yes, it remains very difficult to fully measure and take stock of 2020 because the pandemic continues even as the new year flips the page. The early exuberance of the vaccine is now colliding with dual realities. First, the logistics of getting it to everyone. And second, convincing everyone to partake. How those challenges are met or not met will have a lot to say about 2021. This morning, our annual give and take over the dawn of the new year. Admittedly, I'm more interested in looking ahead than looking back. But we must also take time to honor the lives lost. We'll do that too today on Flashpoint. All right, now let's start with our intrepid roundtable. And after last year, anyone agreeing to this kind of conversation must clearly be described as intrepid. I'm joined by Democratic Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, CEO of the Detroit Regional Chamber. Above her there is Sandy Barua, the editorial uh, page editor at the Detroit News is Nolan Finley. To the right of Sandy and uh, on your lower right-hand side there is the host of Detroit Today on WDET, Stephen Henderson. Let me start by pointing out, gang, that as I look back at last year's prognostications, not of one one of you predicted a worldwide health crisis. So clearly I need to uh, steer away from long-term <laughs> outlooks. <laughs> and let's focus. We're to ask the question, Debbie. <laughs> That's, I guess. Let's focus instead then on where we are as we enter 2021. And Congresswoman Dingell, I want to start with you because for many, you summed up precisely where we are with your comments that you made that quickly went viral on Christmas Eve, talking about the frustrations and the fears that you're hearing every day from your constituents. No one, Devin, people are, I'm so used to fighting with no one, I got ready to come out of the box that way. <laughs> Devin, people are really, um, they're scared. I mean, yesterday, even after what I said last week and the House passed it on Monday, I got a, a note from someone in, in my district talking about someone who had tried to commit suicide out of just sheer desperation that he had tried to get help in so many different places. Yeah. He couldn't afford his medicine, didn't know how he was going to live. We need to do something. And, and when I hear Senator Mitch McConnell say it's uh, too much money, people don't need it, Quite frankly, there are people that do need it that we are not even getting help to. And we need to be talking about how we're going to help those as well. Uh, well, Nolan, is she, is she brought you up. Let me uh, let me go to you next. Um, what have we learned, do you think, after the first round and watching the way the rest of the world uh, has dealt with this? What have we learned about the best way to help people? And are we doing that? Well, I think shooting money out of a confetti cannon is not the best way to do it. You have you should be targeting whatever money we spend at the people who actually need help. You if you, if you haven't lost your job this year, if you're still working, still bringing in an income, you probably don't need help. But if you lost your job this year and had a pretty good paycheck in 2019, you're at risk of not getting help even though you may be suffering. This should be much more targeted, much more strategic, aimed at helping the people who need help. In terms of a stimulus, I think we saw in the spring, might do a little good. I think the, the PPP loans did more, more good, but you're sending out pick, um, checks to people who can't get out and spend it locally because you know, you're, not, you're not out and about and your restaurants are, are closed and many of your stores are limited. So who's going to benefit from these stimulus stimulus checks, Amazon. I mean, might as well just write these checks, send them, send them straight to Amazon. 
We also heard, though, too many stories, Nolan, about people who took those loans and did things that uh, didn't exactly sound like they were addressing uh, this crisis. But, Stephen, right. you know how this goes in Washington. So much stuff gets tagged and stuffed into these uh, big sausage casings when you put a, together a thing like this that it's never as simple as just helping those in need. No, it's not, and that's the that's the legislative process. That's the way it works. Uh, it's disingenuous for Republicans to act as though uh, this is different uh, from other uh, lawmaking. This is the way it goes all the time. Nobody talked about means testing when they were giving a trillion dollars in tax cuts away uh, a few years ago, whether people needed that or not. Uh, this is a really different situation. You are talking about uh, a global pandemic that has uh, not just threatened public health, but of course threatened everybody's economic stability. And even if you haven't lost your job, think of the number of people who've lost pay, uh, taken pay cuts, uh, don't have as much business as they used to. Uh, the idea that there is a massive number of people who are just going to soak this up uh, from the trough, so to speak, yeah. is absurd and insulting. Uh, everybody is hurting. Everybody needs this help. And frankly, even if they didn't, uh, the, the idea that the approach ought to be to make sure that those who don't need it don't get it, rather than to just make sure that everybody who does need it does get it, uh, speaks volumes about where people's values and priorities are. We have learned so much about that this year, and it is terribly, terribly disappointing. Sandy, you are talking every day to business owners and business leaders. As we look forward, what will make the difference in 2021? What is the prescriptive for fixing so much of this damage and, and uh, shoring up what needs shoring up the most? You know, Devin, thank you for giving me the easiest question, and, and I'm serious about that. The easiest answer to that question is getting a handle on the pandemic. Everything, uh, you know, our, our health situation, our economic situation is all directly tied to how well we get a handle on the pandemic. Right now, the United States is the worst performing rich industrialized country in the world in terms of responding to the pandemic. And frankly, that's not by accident, right? You know, you know, we as a country made specific choices or frankly didn't make choices that would have put us in a better position. And even right now, we are seeing that, you know, while the manufacturing of the vaccines has gone well, I think the initial distribution has gone well, you know, we're only we've only used about 10 to 12 percent of the vaccines that are out there. So 2021 is all about one issue. And that is getting needles in arms. We need to get to 70% of our population, both in the state and across the nation, vaccinated. And that will help resolve both our health crisis and our economic crisis. Well, Congresswoman Dingell, then this is, the response to this virus has become so politicized. Uh, it, we, we keep boiling it down to the masks. It's a lot of different parts, uh, though, that have become political matters. Do you see that changing just because we change administrations? Well, I think that the first thing you're going to see is that in the first action that President-elect Joe Biden took was to establish a COVID uh, strategy task force. And he has already appointed three leaders of that. They're going to focus on the different aspects of it. He's going to, he's been very clear, he is going to issue a national mandate for a 100-day mask requirement. How did masks become so political? Yeah. We know. It's been documented. It saves lives. Why, why can't we just wear these masks? It's ridiculous. But Sandy's absolutely right. We can't rebuild an economy until COVID's under control. And we've got to help. Uh, you know, one of the problems is, you know, Pfizer's sitting here in Michigan, and the government's still not telling them where to ship the vaccine. And there aren't syringes available to be able to give people the vaccine. We have to, do, we have to have a plan to give that vaccine. We have to convince people that it's safe to get that vaccine. We have to help people live and, and get through this, and then we can start to rebuild our economy. Well, and Nolan, as we, cont we continue to watch this fight over whether it's the federal response and have they finished theirs now and now it's up to the states, arguing over who's doing this, when nobody can agree on whose baby it is, nobody's taking care of the baby. Well, we knew this vaccine was coming for a long time, and we were assured by the administration that they'd turned it over to the Army and we would have the best logistic mind, logistical minds in the world 
working on this distribution. And here we are, here we are in some places, uh, we've got uh, vaccine spoiling because it's so organized. Other places are just say first come, first serve and lined up. There should have been, we had time to develop a strategic plan. And I think, I, I wonder if anybody on the panel can say when they when they'll be able to get the vaccine and how they'll know. We still don't know, and we've been asking this question, we still don't know how people will be notified that it's their turn to get the vaccine. But on the other hand, I think the promise of the vaccine and the reality of the vaccine has changed attitudes over the last month or so. We see home sales, home prices surging. That suggests people believe better times are ahead and yeah, we're gonna yeah. come through this. I think I agree with Sandy. It's all about getting to that 70%. All right, got to take a quick break. When we come back, I'll let uh, Stephen take the first swing. When we come back, this is Flashpoint on Local 4.